I'm George Curtis. Welcome to It's Your Law. Each week it's my privilege to bring guests that teach us all about the law. The law is a career. The law is a tool for justice. The law is a tool for wealth. And the law is a savage beast that can cause headaches and heartaches and put people in prison. It's the guests that make this show. We get people with experience making the laws, breaking the laws, enforcing the laws, and having some ideas on how the law can be improved and better used. Today's guest is a treat. Jim Herrick is somebody I've known, I suspect, for an excess of 40 years. He comes from a law family. I knew his dad, a great lawyer, his uncle over in Eau Claire, Duke Herrick, and uh, I have known Jim since he's been practicing law in Fond du Lac so well that I haven't gotten very much business out of Fond du Lac in the last 50 years, and we're going to talk to Jim and find out why. Welcome <laughs> to the show. Good to see you, George. Thank you for having me. How many years have you been a practicing trial lawyer? Well, I started on September 5th, 1968, so that gives me, what, 52, 53 years, something like that. And still going strong. You're a trial lawyer, and you can't say that about many lawyers, that they actually are trial lawyers. They take cases to the jury. That's very, that's very true. Uh, when I started practicing in Fond du Lac, there were seven very busy A-rated trial lawyers. Now there's one, and you're looking at them. It's what's happened. I, I don't know. People aren't trying cases. They don't get the experience. They don't have the knowledge. And really, if they're in that type of situation, they shouldn't be representing someone on a case. Well, that's a fact, but uh, let's add a little bit to the recipe. Trying a case is a little bit like running a marathon. It isn't just a case of putting on a clean shirt and going to the courthouse. There is a lot of preparation and crisis and strategy and expense and risk in going to trial and putting two or three years work out on the table and let a jury do thumbs up or thumbs down. Uh, explain a little bit what it's like for the client as well as the lawyer. Well, number one, when you go through a trial, you have the anxiety, the risk of waiting and losing. You have cost advance. You can't tell really what a jury is going to do. You never know if you're going to have a favorable jury unfavorable jury. One person on the jury can control the operation as to what goes on in the jury room. So we like to try to settle cases, keeping in mind that if you don't settle the case, you should have the ability and the resources to be able to go in and spend the money and do what's necessary in order to do justice for your client. Now, if you represent an insurance company, you don't have that issue. But if you represent an accident victim, you have a big problem with that. I can tell you that I had a, a whiplash case where I won't mention the insurance company. I think this company is well known throughout maybe the nation, for all I know, of being not only cheap, but just really, uh, I mean, just kind of unfair. And I'll give you an example of that. When we had our mediation, which we'll talk about later, I guess, uh, they sent a lawyer up who was in-house on a salary. The mediator came in from out of town and they said, we won't pay more than $2,500 on the case. I said, my medical and chiropractic bills are 15,000. It's 2,500 bucks unless you beg and maybe we'll pay five. That was the statement. I said, mediation over, obviously. I'm not going to beg for anything. That's why they have Courtroom. So the mediator went back. I got a bill for 750 bucks, and I called this lawyer up from this company, and I said, "Why didn't you just call me up and tell me this is what you're going to do? Because you know this hurts my client financially. No matter what we recover, we're going to have to deduct that amount of money." And the answer was, "We like to make it rough on people." So. That's why you tried to get a case settled in mediation. I tried that case. I think the verdict was just under 80000 but we spent $24,700 on experts and depositions and videotapers and everything. 
So if we had had an adverse result, and thank goodness we didn't, my client would have been, my client wouldn't have been in jeopardy. My client would have been obviously unhappy. The client was happy with the result, but we would have had all those expenses to take care of, which our office would have done, obviously. Trials have gotten a lot more expensive in the period of time that you and I have been trying them. Why is that, Jim? Expert testimony is a lot of it. I mean, it used to be that you could hire an expert, you'd pay an MD a thousand bucks, come in and testify, or maybe take a videotape deposition, pay the videotaper a thousand dollars, court reporter three hundred dollars. Now the experts are five, some are ten thousand dollars to testify. Uh, videotaper has not gone up that much. Court reporting fees though have gone up. So it's pretty hard not to get at least $7,500 into a deposition of an expert, like an MD, plus the preparation for the deposition, which is normally another $1,500. Then they want to meet before the deposition so they know what you're going to cover. That's usually another $1,000. So 10, I always say $10,000 per expert. That's what we're going to pay if we have to try the case. And so in a small case, you're going to lose money for your client winning the case, but you don't have a lot of options except the one we're going to get to in the next segment. But I want to give you a thought to think about for our first break, and that is why aren't we getting the actual treating physician to carry the burden of coming to court and testifying about their patient's injuries like we used to? Hold that thought and we'll be right back. Welcome back to It's Your Law. I'm George Curtis. My guest is Jim Herrick, Fond du Lac lawyer of at least 40 years success. So much success it's been pretty unprofitable for the rest of us to be trying to get a lot of business out of Fond du Lac. Uh, I knew Jim during that entire period of time. Of course, I knew his dad and his uncle. And he's got a son practicing law there in Fond du Lac. I guess the bottom line is stay the hell out of Fond du Lac. <laughs> <laughs> the Herricks got it tied up. But Jim, we were talking in the first session about the fact that trying cases, personal injury cases, which is primarily what you and I have done, has gotten so incredibly expensive and yet, one of the things you just touched on, and I want you to discuss a little further, is at one time, we simply called the treating physician. And the treating physician would come to court for $800 to $1,500 and tell the jury what the injury was, what the treatment was, and whether or not there were permanent residuals. That's not working anymore. Why? Those days are over. The experts are not required to come into court. I suppose you could subpoena them subpoena the expert, but that makes it very difficult. Almost all of the medical experts are deposed. We videotape them. Uh, the cost of doing this type of business has gone up. The experts charge what they consider to be a reasonable fee, which is four or five times more than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. We're faced with that reality. And the only way to get that amount lowered is going to court and get some type of a court order. And you're not going to get it because if they all charge it at that same level, that's where the court's going to set the, the, the bar. So if you have a case, like I explained before, uh, and you want to call in a medical expert, it's going to be about $10,000. Now, you can bring in, there's other experts that are non-medical, like uh, reconstruction experts and whatnot. They will come into court, but they're very, very expensive. And that's really the client's expense. Now, you and I, when we lose a case, and we, we have lost one or two, uh, <laughs> we may eat that expense, but basically under the Champerty Law and our fee contract, it's the client's expense to finance the expert witnesses and the costs. And so that is something that has to be figured into the decision of the client. Do you want to take the gamble of going to trial or do you want to settle for something that isn't quite what you had hoped for? Absolutely. And I tell people that come into my office when we first discuss retaining me, what my fee schedule is, what it's going to cost, what the situation is, I always say this. 
when this is over, when we receive some type of an offer, you may love me, you may hate me, but the bottom line is you want to know what you take home out of this office. And that's the way it works. So the value of mediations is a lawyer can afford it. Well, some lawyers don't do this. In fact, I, I think most of them don't. But I know you do and I do. We take a lesser percentage of the settlement if we go to mediation and get the case settled. So that's a big benefit. Plus, we save all those expert fees. So I have a mediation coming up next week, and I've already advised my client that if we go to trial, we need two of her treating physicians. That's $20,000 right there. So you have, through the mediation process, the saving of the attorney's fees, hopefully, if that's what the contingent fee agreement provides, plus the expert, all the depositions, and then the insurance company has the right to hire its own expert. And they're usually someone that's been around the block at least 150, if not 200 times. They know what they're doing, quote, when they testify, end of quote. And they're going to be videotaped. And if you want a copy of that videotape, you're going to have to travel down there, get a copy of the transcript. Because it's very, very expensive if you can't settle a case in the absence of mediation. Well, mediation is a part of alternate dispute resolution. And we've had a statute now for maybe a dozen years that seems to require that we report to the court that we have completed alternate dispute resolution in order to be able to have a jury trial, that very expensive trial you have very accurately described. What does alternate dispute resolution include? What are the options? Well, the option is, is that the court can direct that the parties get together and choose what is considered to be a neutral person to attempt to settle the case. It's normally an attorney, but some people will choose a judge. I would prefer a practicing attorney as opposed to a judge. And they get together and they, both parties pay half of the cost of the mediator and they try to get the case settled uh, through the negotiation process and avoid that expensive trial. Well. I understand uh, from some positive experience in your office that uh, you certainly haven't stopped trying cases, but you're kind of making a transition to being a mediator, more and more a mediator, and that's good for me. It means you're not getting all the business in Fond du Lac, uh, <laughs> but it's good for the people who use your services because the experience of a lawyer that's had a couple hundred jury trials the respect that you have in the community with the judges and most importantly with the insurance companies, when Jim Herrick says that this case should be settled for $90,000, I'll bet even the insurance companies listen. They do a lot of the time, but when the insurance companies normally come to mediation, they've already set what their number is. So. My job, I think, as a mediator is attempt to settle the case, of course, but the way to do that is to make sure that everybody has all the facts right and everyone has all the law right. Now, once in a while, we run into a situation where one of the parties doesn't have the law right, and when they're advised what the law is and they have a client, that can cause some uh, irritability, let's say, not with the mediator so much, but with the client's attorney. But in any event, that's what the job is. The second job is a lot of lawyers representing insurance companies want to, quote, hold money back. And I'm, I don't believe that that is the purpose of mediation. The purpose of mediation is to get the ca case settled. And if, in fact, it requires the lawyer to offer all of the authority that the insurance company has extended, then the lawyer should do so. So part of the mediator's job is to extract from the lawyer representing the insurance company what's the, what's the bottom line, how much are they going to pay in order to avoid that trial. Then go back and talk to the plaintiff and not necessarily tell them that at that point in time, but it ask the plaintiff after going through all the numbers, do you really want to go through a trial or do you think X number of dollars will do it and hopefully X number of dollars will be that authority the insurance company puts out there and we have it done. Well, a mediation can be 
a lot less stressful for the litigant than a full-fledged jury trial with the anxiety of it being all or nothing. And that's going to be the first question I ask you when we come back after our next break. Okay, we'll be right back. Welcome back to It's Your Law. Jim Herrick and I are talking about trials and mediations. Jim's well respected throughout the state as a trial lawyer. I've had the good and bad fortune of having cases against him, but they're always done very competently, very professionally. I've had the occasion where there are a couple of cases that he has chosen to withdraw from, and I've picked up his file, and I want to tell you this man believes in preparation. His clients really get a 100% effort. There isn't any guessing, but I think preparation is part of your bag of tricks as a mediator too, isn't it? Absolutely. A good mediator reviews all of the information, and I have at least a mental checklist. I don't write it down. I don't have to at this stage, but there's approximately 15 items that I go through, and I know what a case is worth pretty much after I've covered those 15 items. If some of those are missing, I'll call up a lawyer and say, hey, I don't have this, this, this. Could you send that to me, if you have it? Because otherwise, I have to know what it is. When we start the mediation process, I always say to the parties, everything you tell me is confidential. But if I can share this, this, this with the opposition, I would prefer to do so. I think it would be helpful. I'm not sure that they understand the full full uh, impact of that information. Plus, I like to meet the people and be able to tell the opposition what I think of the people. You know, a lot of these people are really good people. In a mediation, they can act themselves, unlike when they're on a witness stand at a trial. Yeah, when you get on that witness stand at a trial, there's so much anxiety, there's so much uh, nervous tension, and I don't think people act like themselves because of that. And I, I can tell you, I'm going to, this case I never forgot, 1986, I had a case uh, against Ron Lampy. You remember Ron? Oh, I do. A very good lawyer here. And we were offered on that case $28,000. And my client came in and said, I have to have at least 32000 Now, you, this is 86. You've got to multiply those numbers times three. And I said, well, they've made a pretty good settlement offer. This is what you net off. We take it right now without the expense. And she said, no, I talked to my chiropractor, and he says if he comes down and testifies, we can get four times more. So to make a long story short, we tried the case, and after contributory negligence assessed against her, she made a terrible impression on the stand. I don't blame her. She was all nerved up and uptight. And after we got done, there was $1,500 left over after we paid the experts, unpaid medicals, and whatnot. And of course, I didn't take a fee. And I said, here's this money. And I said, I bet you're just really mad at me and I don't blame you. She said, you know, I am mad at you. You did a beautiful job trying the case, but you should have made me settle. So I tell all my clients that story since then where I have some difficulties because there is a big risk going in the trial. You never know what's going to happen. And that's why mediations really are helpful because they bring the people to the table and make you think twice. Well, you've touched on a couple of points there. Number one, the stress that most people feel in being in a trial with everything at stake with either a yes or no vote, being in the view of the jury, the court officers, and the public for two or three days, as compared with a mediation where you and your clients are in one room with a pot of coffee, and uh, the insurance company and the insurance representative is in another room, and the mediator is going as a traveling diplomat from one room to the other room, it's a much more relaxed setting. That wouldn't be important to you or me. We like being on the stage. But it makes a big difference in the stress level of the clients, doesn't it? Oh, sure. And people are not happy. 
I mean, even when they are successful after a trial, a lot of times they say, well, it never goes through that again. It was just too much. I couldn't sleep for two weeks before the trial. I couldn't sleep through the trial. And you go to mediation, you get the case resolved, you know what you have, you, the money will be forthcoming in the next two, three weeks from the insurance company, and it's over and done with. And, and expenses are a lot less, and I think People have to remember one thing. You can't win a case at mediation. No one really wins a case. What you do is you arrive at a fair result. So it's called, in some ways, a comp it's called a compromise, but I call it a win-win for both parties because you've saved that expensive trial. Well, we've covered several points here that I think might be worth reviewing. First of all, you pointed out how expensive trials have become so that in everything but the very largest case, you can win the trial and your client still loses in the bank account. Right. Secondly, you've d discovered and discussed the stress that a trial has for many people and that uh, if they can get a fair result by mediation without the stress, most people would intelligently make that choice. But I think two other points that you've made is how important preparation by the attorney is in preparing the case for trial, preparing the case for mediation, and I'm sure as a mediator, you're gonna be the same as you were as a trial lawyer and are as a trial lawyer, the most prepared guy in the room. And as the Boy Scouts say, you can't beat preparation. Absolutely, and it's unfortunate though that in, my, in some of my mediations with some lawyers that I would really think highly of would come, have come in and have not been well prepared and maybe didn't understand the law in the case. I had one where both sides didn't understand what the law was. It's very disappointing. I've never run into that situation with youth and uh, I, I'm happy about that. Uh, but it's been a few times when I've had that. Well, Jim, this has been a pleasure and an honor that you come on the show. I wish you the very best as a mediator. I intend to request you as a mediator as often as I can. I hope you're so successful that you'll start turning down those good personal injury cases and tell people, you know, there's a lawyer up in Oshkosh still going to court. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks, Sarge. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My friend Jim Herrick is right. Litigation is getting more and more expensive. In most cases, mediation is a less expensive alternative and puts more in the client's pocket. However, the insurance companies still write the checks, and they know which attorneys have the courage and the talent and the willingness to take your case to trial. And so those lawyers those that are willing to carry the fight and win it are the ones that get the best settlement at mediation. I'm George Curtis. That's my opinion.